Welcome back to Create Out Loud. I'm Jen Loudon, your host, and today we're going to talk to someone who has deeply influenced how I think about story and work with writers. Her name is Lisa Cron. She's a story coach, and she has three books out that really are must-reads if you're interested in story or writing story, memoir, fiction, etc. Wired for Story, Story Genius, which I refer to all the time and refer people to get all the time, and her newest, Story or Die. Story or Die is the book you have to read if you wonder why people believe what they believe. How can they believe in QAnon? How can they believe that the election in the U.S. was stolen? Read Story or Die, and you may understand. Lisa started out working in publishing at W.W. W. Norton. She's been an agent for literary agencies. She's been a producer on shows for Showtime and Court TV, a story consultant for Warner Brothers and the William Morris Agency. And since 2006, an instructor in UCLA's Extension Writers Program. I used to take classes back in the day there in the 80s after I graduated from film school. She's on the faculty of the School of Visual Arts MFA program in New York, and she coaches writers day in and day out. If there's somebody that you want to help you understand why your novel or your screenplay or your memoir doesn't work, Lisa is the most brilliant person. So we're going to dive in and we're going to hear something really startling. And this has to do with signature themes and how we build our body of work. So stay tuned for that revelation with Lisa Cron. Lisa, what does story mean to you? Story itself is literally built into the architecture of our brains. We think in story, we make sense of everything through story, and we approach every story. And by story, I mean whether it is a novel or a memoir or a movie um, or all the series that we've been binge watching that we swear we'd never watch. And now we've gone through them and we're sad there were only 152 episodes. Exactly. Like my friend's addicted to Grey's Anatomy and she's like, I want to watch something else but I feel bad if I leave them. <laughs> <laughs> Their feelings will be hurt. <laughs> like, they'll, they'll miss me. <laughs> we do think that because we really do enter that world and they do become real to us because we are in that world. And the point is, story is story, regardless the format, regardless the genre. And story really first came in, not as something fictional or something auxiliary or just enjoyable. Story is really how we learn things and how we figure out what facts and ideas and concepts mean to us. And this is what our brain does automatically when we encounter any fact. It takes the fact and it spins it into narrative and lets us know how will that affect us, boots on the ground, in terms of our subjective reality and our our agenda. Is it going to help us? Or is it going to hurt us? We spin everything into story. We think in story. And stories are enjoyable so that we'll pay attention because we approach every story asking one thing, and you know, what's known in our, as our cognitive unconscious, which is what am I going to learn here that's going to help me make it through the night? What am I going to learn that's going to help me survive in the physical world? And for, you know, about the, oh, 100,000 years, what am I going to learn here that's going to help me survive in the social world? Meaning, the world of other people. That's yeah, your, the story for. Your work around this and all three of your books has informed my writing life. And one of the subsets of my business is working with writers. I refer to, to what you just said over and over again, but I'm going to ask you the question again. What does it mean to you? Because when I look at your career, it is a career of story. It is a career of serving, exploring story, whether it's in publishing or agency or producing, story coaching, story consulting. So what does it do to you? What does it mean to you? Why, why did you get into this business? Why did you get obsessed with this? That's a really great question. I think that I have always, like all of us, right? We all love stories. There's never been a, you know, a society on earth that didn't have storytelling. So I was really pulled into it. And I started to notice and to think about the fact that when I was trying to figure out like what to do in my life, if I had some sort of a problem or I was struggling with like, how to handle something, it wasn't thinking about what would my mom do or my sister do or my best friend do. I was thinking about what would, <laughs> full disclosure, and this is like so goes against so many of my beliefs, but my favorite TV show of all time is Father Knows Best. I know, I know, 
but it is. <laughs> but but it's a great example of the cognitive unconscious. My stories every minute of every day. But I would think, okay, what would Margaret Anderson do? What would what would Jim Anderson do? What would John Boy on the Waltons do? Or whatever current movie I'd seen or book I'd read. That's when I realized that I was being influenced so much by what I read and by the stories that I took in. I went into publishing. I wanted to be a writer. That's what I wanted to do. I, I wanted to be a novelist. And so after college, I went into publishing. I worked at W. W. Norton, fabulous company. I love them then. I love them now. Still one of the few independent companies out there have not been bought up by any of the big six, big five, big four. <laughs> right, right. We watched it shrink over our, our many years in this business. There's so few left. But so, but I lived in Brooklyn. I lived in Park Slope and I would take trains, seven train into Manhattan. And I would look at all the ads in the subway and I would look at them and I'd think, why would they think that that would make me or anybody want to buy that product? <laughs> like, I always thought they got it really wrong. And I would like compose letters in my head to write to the company. Like, how could you possibly think that anybody would want to buy this? Don't you understand that this makes us feel? So I was always looking at that story in that way. And being curious and critical in a, in a positive way about how story works. Well, yeah. And why? It's never about in story in life and anything. It's never about the what. It's always about the why. So it was, why would you think that was interesting? And then when I started to really do what I do, which was in publishing, I was reading manuscripts. I've worked for the studios, you know, reading books to film. So reading screenplays and books to see if they could be translated. And then I worked in as, as a producer in reality TV before it was reality TV. And, and I've read thousands and thousands of manuscripts in analyzing them because I couldn't just go, this, this is great and this sucks, forget this. I had to say, why? And what I realized in doing that was that everything I'd been taught about writing and story was wrong. And this is what I say to writers all the time. Everything I had learned was wrong because what was going to yank me in and pull me in and made me really part of that story was something that was not taught and that was really the opposite of what was taught. I sort of started moving toward that and I thought, well, that's my theory, right? This is what I think. And luckily for me, brain science was just burgeoning at that point. And it went from, this is what I think is true to this is what is biologically true. You could expand your theory and give it some yeah. legs. And that was really thrilling. I mean, to full disclosure, what really pulled me in and what my agenda is beyond just story or even beyond we think in story and this is how when you want to change anybody's mind about anything, it's through story. And again, when I say through story, I don't mean through once upon a time. I mean through figuring out their why, their story, and then finding the place where what you want them to do actually intersects with that and why the reason why they wouldn't hear what you were saying according to them and their story is something that you can show them is untrue. Not show, not, not show them or tell them, but have them experience, experience. exactly true and more true to the way that they see the world. In all that, I really saw and the research kind of bears out that so much of what we've been taught about how we as humans process the world is wrong and is deeply misogynist. My goal is to flip that. I really want to challenge the patriarchy. That is what I want to do more than anything. I'd like to flip the patriarchy. Flip the patriarchy through story. Yes, exactly. But through what really is true and what we've been told is hard science. Right. And not only is not hard science, but is a myth is a hundred percent of a myth as opposed to what's actually true. And the myth that we've been sold is when we want to make any decision, when we want to, you know, make any sort of a decision or figure anything out, we're supposed to marshal all the facts, all the figures, all the data and analyze it dispassionately in the cold light of objective reason. And while we do that, what we must do is to keep emotion at bay because emotion's going to, you know, sneak in and <laughs> try to cloud your judgment as if the best way to be the way that we're the most human, this objective, rational, logical, way of being, which actually is biologically not only impossible, but if we were that way, we wouldn't be here. And that emotion is its nemesis. And that the goal of emotion is to make us be illogical. What biology has shown us and brain science has proven is that if you couldn't feel emotion, you couldn't make a single rational decision. We don't, we don't make decisions based on our rational analysis of the situation. 
we make decisions based on how that rational analysis makes us feel because emotion mainlines or telegraphs meaning. And when it comes to story, that is what is pulling us in, not what's happening in the plot, not external dramatic things. I like to use the term objectively dramatic, which is an oxymoron. If it's objective, it isn't dramatic. It's only dramatic if it's affecting someone whose skin or brain we are inside of as they are trying to figure out what to do. And again, that is biology. That is what we're wired to come for in every single story that we hear. We don't look for you know, what's happening, what's the plot. We look for who's it happening to and what is their motivation. So the two people I think that we owe the most <laughs> who are just, let's just say it, like, they were just wrong, are Plato, who's the person who said it is logic and emotion and the two are rock'em sock'em robots and they're, you know, they're <laughs> And Aristotle, who said first, character second, completely untrue. And brain science has, you know, <laughs> has revealed actually 100% that when we are pulled into a story, first part of our brain that comes up is the part that mentalizes, which doesn't go to what's happening. It goes to who is it happening to? What do they want? What's their motivation? What are they afraid of? That's just how we're wired. So I'm going to answer the question for you that I ask you, what does story mean to you? Flip the patriarchy. <laughs> I've read your books. I followed your work for a number of years now. I've interviewed you before for my Oasis community. One of the things I love about following someone's career and trajectory is how there's a signature theme that emerges. It feels like the signature theme that has been emerging for you is tied to this natural curiosity and obsession about story, and then tied to your great political awareness and activism too, so that those two are sort of coming together. And I just, I love the arc of people's creative lives. So that, that's my 10 cents watching you. I really agree. I think it's so important to say what you believe. I know I just started following Mark Bittman, who I love. He's, cook. He's got this new thing, the Bittman Project over on Substack, you know, that's now doing all of the newsletters. Letters. Yeah. And people are, are publishing, talk about self-publishing. They're there going, okay, I'm not going to be at the New York Times anymore. You know, I'm going to be, now I'm doing my own. And he said in his sort of mission statement, he said, some people tell me, don't be political, but I'm sorry, I have to be. This is what makes me so excited about working with people and so excited about when I write about signature themes in my book, Why Bother, and other places. We have to give them time and attention, and we have to be seen having them, whether it's in a podcast conversation, which is a super public way to have it, or whether it's in a coaching conversation or a therapy conversation or friends, you know, support group of some kind. We have themes in our lives that are drawing us forward to do our creative work to bring together ways of seeing and being and thinking. And when we downplay them or we don't pay attention to them, we don't allow elements from different parts of our lives or different interests to come together, we get in our own way for no good reason. Can you imagine if Lisa says to herself, well, I can't marry together story in this way and politics in this way. I have to just stay in my lane over here. Have you ever done that to yourself? Stop it. That is stopping what our episode, a few episodes back, and Lore calls idea sex. We have to let our different interests and areas keep growing and keep talking to each other. I see so many of my clients and students put themselves in, in boxes or, or silos and when that falls away and things get to start cross-pollinating, oh, it's so exciting. I just had this happen with a, with a client. Yeah, signature themes. Let them talk to each other. Let them develop. Where are you saying no, or I can't, or I shouldn't? Where are you saying that's not my expertise, or that's not my lane, and why? That was always a trap. It was used for black athletes. It was used for women athletes. It was used for actors, actresses, musicians. And I get it too. I got a scree yesterday in my email box and my assistant's like, do you want me to just take her off our email list and delete? I'm like, please, <laughs> please. I'm not going to engage with your racist rhetoric. Here, here's a question that I need to go back to. What happened to being a novelist? I did write fiction. I actually wrote a novel. I had an agent. It did not sell. I then decided to be a screenwriter. I have written probably 10, 11 screenplays. I mean, completely 100% self-taught. Part of that is how I learned what I learned about story itself. One of the screenplays I wrote got me to a producer who I worked with for years. He did not, he did nonfiction. <laughs> you know, that was how I got into the reality TV before it was reality TV. 
I think that at the end of the day, my skill is not in writing fiction. I can look at anybody's story, anybody. I don't care if it's a, if it's a screenplay, I don't care if it's a novel, and I can tell you what's working, what isn't, why, and then dive into, because it's always, it's never the what's not working in the plot, because that isn't the point. It's what's not working in the character. It's just, it's the funnest thing to do. I love my job. The days fly by. I read someone something and then we can get on the phone. It's interesting, since I have learned what I've learned about story and really, I want to say codified, but I don't mean, because it's not formula. It has nothing to do with that. I was talking to someone yesterday who was saying, you know, I've read all the story structure books and it's this and then there, there are seven plots. And I'm thinking, you are insane. I mean, I went to USC film school. I started learning that stuff in 1980. Well, before that in fiction writing, you know, started studying writing in 1980. And it wasn't until Story Genius, your second book, that it all clicked for me and you truly have unlocked how to truly build a story from the inside out and and memoir it works for memoir too I I use it with memoir writers too but I'm driven because I think so much of it's wrong and I think part of it comes from being female realizing from a very early age that gender is something that is a social construct and mm -hmm. literally not real and fighting against it my whole entire life. It makes me want to go, no, you can't put me in that box. It makes me angry. One of the things I was the angriest about when I was reading manuscripts is that it wasn't that people were necessarily bad writers. It was that they had been misled, angry about the writing world. As I say to writers all the time, if the writing world that gives advice <laughs> was a person, I would punch it in the nose and go to jail happily. It's part of the and sometimes it's hard for me to go back in the day and speak at writers conferences sure I feel like what everybody else says is wrong I, just I like, understand that I really do I when I when I'm coaching writers I keep in mind that that what I believe works and I also keep in mind trying to not inflame them so that what they hold that works then they get entrenched in it. There's that way that you have to use the same techniques you're talking about in the new book to convince writers if they've heard whatever they've heard from it's, Stephen King to John Gardner to oh yeah those grid things or whatever that thing is that people do those grids oh my god those drive me crazy or grid it's like what the and the only place I ever got trolled was on a website that I used to uh, do a monthly column on and I I said often you go to writers conferences and they'll, they'll have little stickers they can put on your on your little badge and it's like are you a pantser or a plotter and I say a pox on both your houses here's why they don't work. I got totally trolled for that. It's people's sacred cows. It does, but it doesn't work. It's funny because I do have a thing in the new book about when you're trying to think of who your target audience is. For me, what I realized is, is that my target audience isn't writers. My target audience is writers who have been around the block, who already have tried, who already know that doesn't work mm. and come to me and are willing to have all of that pulled apart. In other words, as I like to paraphrase, it's like from that song in The Music Man, it's like the sadder but wiser writer for me. That's who come to me. can think of only one time in the past, I don't know, four or five years where I had someone come to me who really was just, I want you to tell me that what I'm doing is great. Everything you're telling me I need, I don't want to have to do for this or that reason. And I thought you were just going to give me gold and tell me exactly what, show me the gold in this. And it's like, you didn't give me any gold. I can tell you what's missing. I can tell you what, what you need. I can't, it just, there, there's no way you can salvage this in the way that you've done it. That's, I, I can't help it. And that's yeah. the only time that's happened because most people have already been around the block or there are a lot of people who are just starting out and they don't have to unlearn. So they come and those are the ones that really take to it. I've worked with quite a few writers recently where this is like the first time they've ever written anything. And because they don't have to unlearn all that stuff, I have to keep telling them, you have no idea how good you are, how hard hard it is for people to learn what you just can do naturally. Astonished by what you say, this is a real reveal of how I think. I'm just regularly astonished two or three times a week how entire ways of thinking get built up in our world that are completely false. Entire ways of being, entire ways of structuring our lives, our governments, our business, our, I mean, we can talk about climate crisis. So we're living in a way as, as a world that is killing us. And in this little microcosm, trying to overturn how we think about story and how we approach it, both for our brains and our, our culture in the new book, 
but as writers in previous books in your coaching business. I just find that very cool. I think at the end of the day, it really comes down to that whole notion of logic versus emotion that is sort of what's destroyed everything mm. because it makes us unempathetic, you know, and it makes us, first of all, it blinds us. I mean, I think the difference is, I think it's very gendered. The reason why we, we're, we're afraid of emotion, men are just afraid of emotion and women are afraid of what men are going to do if they say anything that sounds like it is emotional or has any emotion in it. So I think it's a very different thing that's what's brought us down along with literally the way that we're wired because we're wired to live in a world that we don't live in anymore. The problem is, is when, you know, when our brains had that last great growth, growth spurt about a hundred and about, about a hundred thousand years ago. And, you know, what we were all taught was, was that the reason for that was that's when we got analytic thinking and it's true. It happened then, but what evolutionary biologists tell us now is, but that wasn't why was because that's when we were wired to need other people. We are all wired to need to belong to a group. When people go, I don't need any Buddy, I'm a lone wolf and I've done everything on my own. I always want to go, you do understand that wolves travel in packs. <laughs> And that in the wolf community, like a lone wolf in the wolf community is a wolf that has done something so egregious to the community that they're ostracized and left to die. That's a right. lone wolf. <laughs> Belonging. It's such a big issue for so many of us. I had to write a memoir for four years <laughs> or 500 pages that didn't work. It became the basis for my book, Why Bother? I had to write that to see some of the themes in my life. And one of the themes was how I kept myself from belonging. I see this with people who join my membership community, The Oasis. Oh, so often they will say, I've been wanting to do this for years. I've been following you for years. I've been thinking this would be just the right support for me but I thought I wouldn't belong here. They make up these really complicated stories. Oh, I'm not a writer. I'm like, well, there's lots of people who belong who aren't writers. They're creatives of every kind. Oh, I'm not creative, but I do blah, 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 right? I quilt, I sew, I dance. I, I'm like, oh, really? You're not creative. So my question to you is, where are you not letting yourself belong? That's the question I ask myself over and over again. Where am I pulling away in my story, uh, no fault of ours, right? It's the way our brains are wired, as Lisa will say over and over again in this episode. But where am I pulling away from belonging? Where am I making up a story that I don't belong? And if you want to belong and you want to learn more about the Oasis, you can always come to jenniferloud.com and click on that link that says the Oasis. We'd love to have you. But we're wired because back 100,000 years ago, let's face it, the world didn't change. Like right now, everything changes exponentially every five minutes. Then what you saw was what you got for eons and eons and eons. And the people who you had to understand, your group couldn't be more than, what's the number? It's 150. It's called Dunbar's number. Robin mm -hmm. Dunbar, who's this brilliant uh, evolutionary, bio or evolutionary psychologist at Oxford. And he said 150, that's what we're wired to be able to deal with. But back then, it wasn't like it is now 150 self-selecting people. It was 150 people, that's the maximum, that's it. So once you really understood how your world worked and the people around you worked, it gets encoded in your brain as permanent, as if that's the way the whole entire world is. And that's the problem. We're still wired that way. First of all, the world changes so much. And second of all, that group of 150 or you know, your family, you, we don't think, well, that's how my family is. But there are other families over there that are different. There are other cultures that are different. There's other religions that are different. We just think this is the way the world is. This is what's normal. And everybody who isn't like that out there, there's something wrong with them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we hope they get a lot of therapy and then join us over here in real reality real soon. And that's not our fault. We don't do that on purpose. That's how we're wired. I really think that's why it's so difficult. Because then when we, when we tell other people and we try to use the facts, which have a completely different meaning for them than they do for us, and they argue back, we just think what's wrong with them. They're self-centered or they're emotional or they're deeply misinformed, which they right. certainly might be. It's not like they made the choice to argue back. It's not like they decided to get angry because they often do. We do. Biology, that is your brain. When someone attacks your beliefs, because a belief isn't just this external belief. A belief is, this is part of my self-identity 
community. And this is how I identify with my group. And we're wired to feel like if we get ostracized from our group, we could die. So that an attack of a belief is an attack of us. And the way we're wired, again, going back to how we were first wired up 100,000 years ago, we're wired to take some, an attack on our beliefs. It travels the same neural pathway as if someone had said, put up your dukes, as if they're going to come and try to punch you. So we react in the same way. Again, we don't decide to get angry. Our brain takes that out of our hands because our brain thinks that somebody might be coming in, you know, about to, to punch us in the face. I mean, sort of fun fact, when that happens, blood rushes to your thighs so that if you need to run away, you can, you know, exit stage left really fast. You have uh, to run. Yeah. And a front to your belief system is like an affront to your physical body because as far as your brain's concerned, which is there to keep you safe, your psychological self, meaning who you are, is the same as your physical self. Because guess what it is? Because when people go, oh, mind, body, it's like, it's all physical. It's all one. I know. When someone says, we now know that our minds affect our bodies. I'm like, I've known that for a long time. (laughs) So I want to change tracks for a minute and talk a little bit about your creative life. You do a lot of different things. You teach writing you speak at conferences, maybe a little bit less, you write and you have to promote your book like you're doing right now. You coach writers. How do you balance it all? What is, what does that balancing planning look like? I kind of suck at that. (laughs) Uh, And I'll tell you the truth. I would like to get much better at that because my whole life is work and has been that way for a long time. And part of it is I love my work. Not like, oh God, I mean, I am one of those people who never looks at their watch and goes, oh my God, wait, it's only 1030. Like, how could that be? The days fly by. The things I know about myself are that I do my best work in the morning. So if I've got to do any writing, if I've now I'm trying to come up with new talks to take out of this new keynotes, I'm actually putting together a class for this fabulous website called Chairman Mom that's going to be called Unlocking Your your Aha. And so I am working on those classes, but I will do that in the morning because Mm -hmm. I am so on in the morning. So that's like we're talking in the morning and it's just so much easier than in the afternoon. In the afternoon, I know I can read anything. I can talk to clients in the afternoon because it's fun. I wish I had a better balance. I'd like to find a better balance. All got the layers that motivate us, right? Mm-hmm. And I think one of my biggest layers goes back to the whole patriarchy thing. Until really recently, I never felt like I could support myself or make enough money to take care of myself. And I do not have any rich relatives. I did not inherit anything. I do not have any investments. All I have is what I bring in full stop, nothing else. Mm -hmm. So, so much of it was, I just need to keep working because I need to make enough money to support myself. I need to make enough money to, I I mean, I really want to work forever. I try to help my kids out or that's really part of it. And I know Mm -hmm. that so much of the way that I am and what my life would have been like, had I not been put into that, your female kind of box from when I was small, I know my life would be completely different. So I am fighting that constantly. And yeah, that, I hear that theme over and over again, and it's strong. I, so, so does that sense of taking care now drive you and it doesn't need to anymore because the business aspects are better? Or is that something that you need to kind of revisit? Or does it still feel valid? It still feels valid. Made more money last year. I, I was stunned. I, I did not realize I'd made as much as I did. And it stunned me. That said, no, because I don't know. It, it keeps going. It keeps going. I don't know that that will ever end. I don't feel like it will in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm at, plus I love my job. I would never want to not work. I think that's why I'm sort of looking to branch out a bit. I don't know if this goes to sort of the creativity in terms of how one does one's time, but I'll tell you something that might be interesting, which is like, I love what I do and I have never had to advertise. I turn people away, never had to work for that part of it. Once it started to come, it just started to come. I feel like I could keep going like that forever. I mean, my books are evergreen and, mm-hmm. and the kind of people are always going to be the kind of people, you know, not for everybody, but my audience. And you shouldn't for be for everybody because yeah. we know that doesn't work. If you're for everybody, you're doing something wrong. Self down so much that you're not really offering anything. It was weird. It was like, even though I love what I do, when I thought, okay, I'm just going to do this forever. And I looked like down to the end of the horizon. It felt like I was like, I was sort of, it was too comfortable, I guess is the way to put it. It just felt like I needed to stretch in some sort of a way. I felt like, no, I needed to challenge myself because there wasn't a challenge in doing what I was doing. And And that's working one-on-one with clients. Right. Which I love. There is something about being a creative and creating out loud that requires challenge and new things. 
Yeah. And I wanted to take this to a different audience. I admit that what had kept me from writing this new book for a, for a long time, because I, I had actually written the proposal for it back when I wrote the proposal for Story Genius. And my publisher wanted both of them at that time. And I kind of thought, let's just do this one. And then, which was Story Genius. And then we'll see. And the thing that held me back was that I was sort of afraid of the advertising world has never been a world that I tell you a quick anecdote when I, I guess it was after Story Genius came out or maybe even before, but I did this TEDx talk mm -hmm. and I, I opened it. And then Jonathan Gottschall, who wrote the storytelling animal, uh, closed it. He's the nicest person on the planet. He's so nice. But I was asking him like, okay, you've written that, that book. Have you gone into consulting? Like, are you doing business consulting? And he said, yeah, I did it once. I did consulting for Pepsi. And he said, I would never do it again because the last thing I wanted was tell them how to, how to sell diabetes juice. Like that was his words. And I thought, yeah, I don't want to be involved in that world at all. But what I realized is that story is story and we're all being affected by it in order to really both understand the effect that story is having on us because we often don't know, which is why I think a lot of people have fallen into that QAnon rabbit hole, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. don't understand what it's doing to us. What's your flavor of self-doubt? How does self-doubt show up for you? Oh God, in two ways. One is, I don't know if self-doubt is the right way to say it. <laughs> a theme is going to emerge. It really has to do with the misogyny, that people aren't going to listen to me because I'm female, I'm not pretty, I'm not young, I'm not skinny, I don't have big breasts. That is really why I really do all my work on the phone. I feel much safer on the phone, very cagey. I'm probably going to move away from this a bit. I'm very cagey about my age. I do not like it out there because I really feel like if people knew there would be that thing in between. That's why I never want to meet anybody face to face. I do not like doing that. I've been marginalized. I feel like my whole life, I've been marginalized in ways that I don't think I even have realized until recently that I just didn't think, I thought, no, people are equal. What's wrong with me that I'm thinking, you know, X, Y, or Z. And now, I mean, I think misogyny is the last uh, acceptable bias because it is, it underlies everything. And the differences and the reason that people get away with it is when you think about racism, just for one second, think about racism, but think about, okay, you think about racism and you go, here's how, and I'm going to use, I'm going to be gendered and say, man, here's how a white man is treated. Here's how black men are treated. We can look at the difference between those two things and go, yeah, that is really racist. That sucks. This, this is white entitlement, male entitlement. This is how black people are treated. I can see the difference. Women are second-class citizens in every religion, in every culture, everything. So there isn't anything to hold up and go, this is how we really should be treated. There isn't that. Uh -huh. And so it is so deeply baked in, which is why my thing is pulling away from the logic and the emotion, because I think emotion is what's been used to vilify women, because men are so afraid of emotion. You know, they allow women to feel emotion, and then they, anytime there's any mention of emotion, as if emotion is a separate thing from meaning, you know, emotion becomes, it kind of consumes the emotional, which is that pejorative term, to consume the whole notion of emotion, and then that becomes a weak thing, that soft science, that softness and strong. The truth is emotion isn't soft. <laughs> it's the opposite of soft. And it's the notion of, of objective reason that is the myth, the, truly the lie. It, it just, it, it could not be, it is not. And we don't think that way. It would be impossible if we did. I think what thinks that way is AI, which is why AI will never work. You know, what I just want to say about realizing how you've been marginalized or how I've been marginalized or how women listening have been marginalized, it feels to me that we're going through a slow moving revolution. And Me Too, I mean, it's been coming in waves and coming with the first wave of feminism, coming with the second wave of feminism, coming with the Me Too movement, coming with Black Lives Matter. The cracks are just going to keep spreading. I hope so. But I know, I know. I'm an optimistic person, Lisa. You have to know that. I am an endlessly optimistic person. I am too. I mean, I feel like I can see the, it's a scary time, but there still is that old Buck Rogers, there's one chance in a million we might make it and I'm going to take that. I think the difficulty in changing misogyny is that it, women can't do it. it. It's men. Men have to change. To the privileged, equality you looks never like- never want to give up your privilege. You just don't want to give it up see the privilege. It's why you get people mm -hmm. going, white lives matter. And you just want to go, mm -hmm. 
or all lives matter. I don't know. You know, I remember when I started with my first book, The Woman's Comfort Book, and I would go out and do these talks and I would do these workshops. And the idea in 1992 of self-care was so radical for women and it would piss them off so much. And I didn't get it at first because I, there's some stories about being a woman that I just didn't get, you know, some, some I certainly got (laughs) and some I didn't, you know, how I would rile people up with this idea that they weren't at the back end call, just the simple idea that they weren't the back end call of everybody in their life and that, and that they, that they came last. Oh yeah. Because women aren't even taught to recognize their own needs mm-hmm. and certainly not to respect them. And certainly not to think if they even have to mention it to someone else, it's like, oh, you're weak and you're asking for something. Right. You know, you're needy. Oh, I'll give it to your needy. Right. Horrible word. Hate the word. Mm-hmm. Needy. I-, I can say that because totally guilty of this, this notion of, oh, well, if you're broken, I need to try to fix you and help you and go there for you. And then I can't ask for anything until you're fixed. But wait, what about, what about me? And it's, there's something wrong and men are not taught to do that. They are just not taught to do that. I want to ask one more question before I ask my last question that I always ask. What is the process of writing your books for you? The last time we spoke, you were starting this new book and you were like, oh God, I'm going to write another book. Totally relate to that. In the nine books I've written, almost all of them have been so hard to write. What's writing like for you? It's really hard. Writing is hard. I I am like that Dorothy Parker that I think is so clever. You know, I hate writing. I love having written. It is really hard. I mean, first of all, I couldn't write without a coach. I mean, I use a coach from the very beginning, someone to bounce my ideas off of, to go, is this clear? Is this not clear? Because I think whether whether you're writing fiction or nonfiction, you know that feeling where you kind of, you really have this notion of what you want to say. And then you realize you've written a great, it's like a crater and you've written a, you've written a circle around it and it's somewhere in that crater. And you That's a perfect, that is a perfect metaphor. Is that a metaphor? I think so. I always get it mixed up. That is a perfect metaphor. I'm going to use that forever. You write around the thing it really is. Always. Oh, and it's frustrating. Okay, that crater metaphor or whatever it is that Lisa just made, it is so important. If you create anything, how clear is that, that we keep circling around? What is it really that I'm trying to say here or make here or paint here? I think one of the keys that I learn when I coach writers and creatives is that taking the time, and it's so hard for me because I'm a completely jump right in with two feet and two hands, But taking the time to really think about, try to articulate, get the support to articulate what is this really that I'm trying to say here? And then really allow yourself to take a stand and be seen taking a stand instead of trying to be everything to everybody can save you so much time and make your work so much more vibrant and real and authentic. I mean, to create out loud, I think it's to jump into the middle of that crater and go, what's here easier said than done, I know. But how often do we just keep circling around it because we're afraid there isn't anything there or it's not ours to own or say, or because we don't want to spend time really trying to articulate it because it feels more like doing math than doing something creative and fun. But this is so often where I see people not then really stretching to connect to their people that they could reach. And it's certainly a huge part of marketing. Get in the crater. (laughs) Should we have a bumper sticker? Maybe like a, sh- a t-shirt, get in the crater. <laughs> Disappears in your head because I mean, here's the thing. That's why when writers come to me and they go, you know, I, I haven't done any work yet, but I know exactly who my characters are and, and you know, and what's going to happen. And I always say to them, well, you, then you've done no work because the thing is, it isn't specific. It isn't nailed down. And we don't think in words. We don't think in sentences. We think in images and sort of feelings and ideas and they float away. It's only when you concretize it. And that's why when you try to grab it, I always picture that, that scene in old, old movie, Lost Horizon, where the woman leaves Shangri-La and then she oh, yes. dust. It's like, it's like, that's what happens. You just turn to dust because there's no, you haven't really gotten it. It is painful. I always think, oh my God, is this going to be any good? What am I doing? People are going to hate it. That's where, when you ask like self-doubt, the one thing I've learned is that 
because I really felt like I had something to say, I really felt like this is a truth that isn't out there. And I want to get it out there I, I, because I want to help. I want to change the world. And I feel like this is a big problem with the world, with the way we see things. And again, none of it's our fault. I mean, everything I write. We not, do get to keep evolving. <laughs> not, we can, exactly. But just if we know what we're up against. Yes, we have to see it. We have to have the distinction. We have to name it. And you do yes. such a great job of naming it. And then we don't blame ourselves because we blame yes, that. When people go, I heard someone, and then I'll get back to what I was saying, but I heard someone on a radio show I used to listen to on NPR years ago, and she was talking to someone, and they were like, why do you think we're so insecure? We're always so worried about what other people are going to think. What makes us so insecure? And I'm, I'm yelling at the radio going, we're wired to wonder what everybody else thinks, that we're not insecure. That's what makes us human. And the problem is once we define that as insecure, now we've got two problems. The fact that, yes, we are always going to wonder what other people think. And now we blame ourselves and we think there's something wrong with us for that. And there is not because that is how we're wired because we need to know, are you safe or aren't you? Again, everything's a value. Hallelujah. Like, am I safe or, you know, or am I not? And that is sort of the point. So coming in with this book, I really thought I have something I really want to say. And I know, I know from past experience that as I write it, I'm going to think a lot of the time, this sucks. This is terrible. This is stupid. People are going to think I'm stupid. And this was an even scarier one because I was going into an arena that's new to me. You know, writers, mm -hmm. I, I feel comfortable with because it's been my world for, for such a long time. But this was going into to places and there's some chapters I actually wrote here where I had to do a lot of research because it literally isn't my world. But I could see how it applied. And I, I like I said, I did a lot of research, but I thought, okay, if it turns out and this sucks and everybody hates it, that's not going to be because I didn't give it everything I had. And I did. I sequestered myself. I went on places where I locked myself in and, and didn't do anything for weeks in order to really write it. Because, you know, if it fails, it'll, it'll fail because I just didn't get it. Not because I didn't give it 150% of everything that I've got. That's why my motto that I've been saying a lot lately is just, you got to love the suck. You mm -hmm. got to embrace the part that is either boring or hard or those voices that are telling, and even the voice, I mean, that voice that's telling you, you know, like, like that thing we used to hear when we were kids, like, if you don't succeed at first, give up, why make a fool of yourself? I mean, that's what that voice is, the, the negative voice that's always telling you, don't do that, don't try that, you're going to get in trouble, it thinks it's helping you. It, it does, it does. It's telling you is the right thing, and it thinks it's protecting you from something that's going to hurt you. Or humiliate you, or basically kill you in some, in right. some form, if not physically, yeah. then... And it's wrong. It's almost always wrong. It's trying to protect you from change. One of the ways I coach people around that is I'm like, let's just do, you take one step and then you notice, did you die? Right. Did, right. I mean, I really want you to check it out. This is, this, you got to check it out. Are you still breathing? Are you still alive? And I had a client come back to me recently and said, yeah, the whole time she was doing X, she was like, am I dead? <laughs> did I die? Am I dead? <laughs> <laughs> this is the best advice. It's funny. Did I used to do um, personal essays, you know, perform them, which was so fun. I fell into it by accident. A friend of mine was teaching a class in New York and she needed like one more person to be in it in order for them to run it. She said, oh, please, will you do this? And I said, sure. And I'd never spoken in front of anybody before. And this is when I discovered that I wish I discovered it earlier because I loved it. What she said to people is she said, when you first go up there, you're first speaking in front of an audience. She said, you have one goal and one goal only. And that is when you're done to walk off the stage and you're still breathing. If you're still breathing at the end, you have succeeded. Everything else is gravy. That made everything so much easier. Here's my last question. I'd like to ask people, what will you learn next? That is a really good question. And I think I can actually answer this. And it does fall into the do what I say, not as I do. Wait a minute. I need to take my own advice <laughs> Quest. Oh, damn, I hate that. <laughs> and I do want to take this book and kind of go into consulting, which I'm already sort of starting to do and have done some of in the past businesses and nonprofits in particular, or just, you know, brands that I believe in and think are good or, or politicians or whatever it would be. What I realized is, is that I don't know enough yet really specifically about their world to understand how they come at their messaging. Because I know it's wrong. I look at it and I know it's wrong. And that's why they come to me. But how they've arrived at that and sort of the methodology that they use and the, the, the world that they're in, because everything I see about it when I hear things, it's like, I can't even believe anybody would think any of that would ever work. Somebody just tweeted something. It's about a book that just came out about, can I swear? Because I guess yes, you can swear. The name of the book. I think the book is about shit jobs. <laughs> 
I think it's but that's not swearing. Was. That's a biological fact. <laughs> but it was about jobs that, that are irrelevant. People who have these big jobs where, where they go, yeah, you know what? This doesn't matter. It doesn't make any difference in any way. In any... And so much of it was about data and collecting and here's how we message blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, I realize I really need to understand that because if I don't understand that, I'm not going to understand exactly the sweet spot that I can come in and go, okay, this is how you've done it. This is what you need to do. Because I know what I'm offering here is also very different because it isn't in the same palette. It's not like we've well, used these words wrong. So now these are the words you want. Right. That's the story uh-huh. consulting we know. And you're looking at something, you're looking at something much more, uh, much deeper and re- right. more, much more revolutionary to use that word again. Really yeah. completely. It's ontological. It is. Yeah. I have learned and benefited so much from your work, Lisa, and I am really, really grateful. And I'm so grateful for this conversation. Oh, thank you. This was like so super fun. (laughs) That's my goal. Yeah, no, I deeply loved it. I'm so happy and I'm so happy for the, you know, kind of the opportunity, especially in such a friendly, you know, safe feeling space to be able to really sort of you know, come out in that way in terms of, you know, this is what I really believe. And I, I realize that as opposed to sort of coming out in a, in a space that is, especially this other kind of consulting I want to do, that feels, would feel more constrained in this way than the writing world, that instead I'm going to bust this open and go, if you want me, this is what I bring along. And if you don't, that's totally fine too. Because on that- Hell fact, yes. <laughs> I'm good to go. I, I That don't. is the definition of create out loud. That is it. It gave me chills all over my body. Thank yeah. you. Boy, I find several things that Lisa said so exciting, including that she wants to keep growing. We know that that's essential to our creative lives, to keep growing. There's lots of things I'm sure you've mastered. And how do we stay juicy with our work? And I also love the idea of subverting the patriarchy with story. Isn't that amazing? So what are you taking away from this episode? What are you going to put in your creative toolkit? Give it a moment's thought. Write it down. Text a friend. You know, if you're listening to the show and you can share it on social media with something you've learned and a link to this episode or any other episode you love, that's a really great way for us to grow. And yet subscribing, downloading episodes, sharing on social media, even just texting or emailing a friend, like I think you'd really love this and a link to wherever you listen to podcasts would be amazing. And speaking of amazing, if you have some time in September, I'm going to be leading one of my signature retreats in North Carolina. It's going to be a luxurious, wonderful time to really think about what's next for you and how you create out loud. So you can always find information about that at jenniferloudon.com under the button that says retreats. Next week, we'll be back with dear friend, New York Times bestselling author and Buddhist teacher, Susan Piper. And we had an in-depth, intimate, wonderful conversation. I know you're going to love it. Everybody loves Susan. We talk about creating with chronic pain. We talk about how she approaches each of her projects, like an art project, even teaching meditation and lots of other stuff. So tune in next week to Create Out Loud. See you then.